everyone, it is finally happening. I am joined by the hype to my bro, the play to my boy, Dean Mutardi, formerly known as Mojo Rawley. It is so great to finally be speaking to you, my friend. We've done it, baby. We've done it. We've been trying to put this one together for weeks. I wanted you to be my first interview, but we just couldn't get it scheduled. It's all good. We'll be the best interview. It's not a problem. Well, That's all that matters. Interview. That's all that matters. Uh, so we're, we're gonna we're gonna play that. It. Too right. We are gonna play a game today called Hype or No Hype, which we'll we'll get to in just a moment. I'm gonna introduce some names, some moments from your career, uh, and you're gonna tell me if they're hype or not hype. But I wanted to open um, because I, I I've been asked a lot through my career, if you can call it that. Um, about why I am so infatuated with you um, and why I am arguably, in fact, there's no arguably about it, the, the biggest Mojo Rawley, Deed Mutardi fan on planet Earth. Um, and I'd love to hear uh, what, what you think about this because my, my first experience of you was actually a clip that was uploaded to WWE's YouTube channel all the way back in November 2015. Um, and you were outside an NXT taping, I believe, talking to a young fan called Jordan, um, and Jordan uh, had been getting B's and C's at school. He was doing pretty well, but perhaps with the power of hype, he was he 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 grew to start getting straight A's. And you was you were so endearing, and it was very very clear that you really you cared about this young man. And there was an obvious connection that you have with the fans. Um, so, so 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 tell me about that moment. Yeah, man, it was really cool. You know, I was trying to figure out what was the first thing, you know, that really uh, got you hyped up and, you know, supporting me from the start. And even cooler to see that it was, you know, related to Jordan, actually. Uh, but pretty much what that boiled down to was Jordan and his mom, Brandy, they um, they were some of the first, like, supporters of NXT slash FCW before it came the, became the monster that it was when we were doing these, you know, little house shows that had, a dozen or less people there and it was kind of the same crowds every show so we'd always get to see like the kids and the families and whatnot you know before and after the shows on the way in they they were they, they wow they became very familiar with us we became very familiar with them and grades were always something that was really important to me because you know I started off as not, maybe not the best student, but, you know, I worked really hard and understood the importance of uh, of an education and having good grades. And that became one of my my defining characteristics. And, you know, when I was playing football, I was just having the highest GPA on the team. And because of that, I was able to play ball and get a shot at universities that I didn't think was possible. You know, I know Maryland probably only took a shot on me in the beginning because I had you know, high grades and I could up the team average. So for me, you know, kind of seeing these kids coming around, it was, you know, always important, you know, what, what's your grade situation like? Cause you know, I know, I know Jordan comes from a good home, but you know, not everybody does and not everybody has a good support system where their, their parents value education that much. So that was always something that I was doing, talking to not only Jordan, but a lot of the kids and checking in with them and, and seeing what was going on with their grades and sometimes even helping them with homework after a, uh, a match, you know, for a quick, you know, 15, 30 minutes or something. And uh, Jordan was just such a cool case because that was just a prime example of, you know, making a difference and just what a little bit of a uh, little bit of a push can do for a person, you know, um, <laughs> symbolically, maybe for wrestling, too. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he had B's and C's, and we, we got on him, and it happened so fast. I think it was the the very next grading period. He came back with a report card of straight A's, and I was trying to think of, you know, what's the best way we can really, really reward this kid and, and show him that this is important and make a difference and really highlight him to where he, you know, wants to keep doing this, and that just becomes who he is. He's the guy that gets straight A's, you know? So we, we, I think I gave him some gear or some signed things. I can't remember exactly, but I do remember announcing it in front of everybody and hyping it up uh, for the entire full sale crowd after a show. And I think that went the longest way because they picked that up and put that on the show, um, Breaking Ground, which I guess was one of their most viewed or popular segments. Um, and I know that's meant the world to his family. They still watch it all the time. I just talked to him the other day, and you know that's still something that they, uh, it's still a highlight for him. So that was pretty cool. 
That's awesome. Are you still keeping in touch with him? How's he getting on? He's doing great. You know, he's uh, getting older. He's getting big. I don't really recognize him anymore. It's been uh, so many years ago, you know, and now he's like uh, huge. So it's uh, another crazy thing to see you. You know, some of your like fans that are kids from day one, you know, nine years later, you know, I started wrestling almost 10 years ago now. Um, you know, that, that's that's a lifetime right there. So these these kids have transformed a lot, you know, physically, mentally, every emotionally, everything. For sure. So we're going to play hype or not hype here. But before we get started, um, can you explain to me what hype is? Man, for me, see, a lot of people, I'm glad you asked that question because this almost killed my career, actually. When I got to WWE, Stay Hyped was something I brought with me be beforehand. You know, um, you know, I don't get hyped, I stay hyped. That was kind of my mantra not only for wrestling, but that was my thing in football too, just having all this energy. It came from, you know, being the last recruited guy on the team and trying to find ways to become the guy to earn a scholarship, you know, to earn a paycheck, whatever that might be, but a place at the table, really. Not, we're not talking Roman Reigns head of the table. We're playing, we're talking just trying to get a place at the table, at the, at the tail end, the last spot on the bus kind of thing. And for me, as the guy that nobody wanted, it was just, I had to show up every day, first to show up, last to leave. I had to be the hardest working guy, but I had to be, you know, hard work goes unnoticed so often. So for me, being out there and loud and hyping up the team and being the guy that could rally a squad, but really being loud enough where the coaches would literally physically see me over there. Like that guy's screaming, screaming his ass off. We can't help but not look to see what he's doing. Oh, wow. He's working pretty hard too. You know, that was kind of, kind of how it was is just having to do all of those things and just be hyped constantly, you know, on no sleep, having the best grades, the the best records in the, the weight room and on the track and the best work that work ethic and attitude and just everything. So that's kind of, kind of where that came from. And uh, when we got to WWE that quickly morphed into just being loud, excited and obnoxious all the time, <laughs> which was part of it. I'm not going to lie, but it wasn't, wasn't the whole thing and uh that kind of got misconstrued along the way but i guess when you know when wwe is like pretty good at like i don't want to say labeling people because that comes off kind of wrong but they, they kind of do like all right here's our hype guy this guy's our giant this guy's our technician you know this this guy's gonna be our guy that is our rep in saudi arabia or whatever you know geographical region we're talking about here but everybody's got their thing they got their gimmick and i guess that was kind of the easiest way to label that but it was never my intent to take it that far down that path so they obviously did pick up and notice you, you talk about the you, you want to grab the coach's attention it's it's true that you uh you ended up training with triple h and did he sort of take you under his wing a bit I never really trained with Triple H in the ring, but what ended up happening was um, we would do we would do our loops Friday to Monday, you know, end with Raw on TV. Everybody would fly home Tuesday, um, sometimes on red eyes on no sleep. Everybody would always go home and rest up, see their families, pick up their kids from school, understandably so. Um, you know, that was always a thing because I was constantly trying to do everything just to get a push that lasted longer than three weeks, like a legitimate push. We always uh, call them semi pushes in the locker room, like a little half push. Um, but my thing is I would land and I would go straight to the performance center right away on no sleep. It was kind of my thing. Um, I also didn't like wasting hours of the day. and I just wanted to get, get started as soon as I touched down. That often ran into a time when Triple H was uh, working out himself. We didn't actually go and train together, per se, um, but he was always there. So when he'd see me coming in after the loop that, you know, he just saw with his own eyes and I'm literally the only guy in the weight room. And I was always I used to tell Sean Hayes, the strength coach there, who's like my boy, one of my best friends. I was like, dude, we're getting after it today. Hunter's here. Or, you know, he would tell me, hey, Hunter's coming in. We got to We're going to do it today because he would train with me sometimes. So that was the day we would do like you know, 64 inch box jumps or, you know, max squats or really try and turn it up. I mean, I always made Tuesday my hardest workout anyways, because mentally I always felt like a badass and I could have my best day after a loop like that. But 
I noticed a couple of times when uh, when Hunter was in there working out, you know, he's doing his thing, but you'd see him peering over and whatnot. And it did lead to some screen time for me a couple of times because I remember I broke a couple of records because that was another thing. I'd always wait to see what the NXT guys would do all week with the records they would set. And then I'd come in on Tuesday and break them and talk trash about it. Uh, not all of them because they had some badasses, but I will say most of them. Um, but a couple of times on records I broke, he filmed it himself and put it on his social media um, to hype up, you know, because for him, it was a good look too, you know, just showing that, hey man, we got a lot of professional wrestlers here that can lift more than professional athletes for anyone that's, you know, kind of doubting that whole thing again. But yeah, it worked out, you know, it's kind of a win-win for me. It was it was perfect, but yeah, it did lead to some uh, some extra love from one of the boss men. So uh, no complaints on that front. That's handy. So uh, we're going to start hype or no hype, rather, with uh, arguably the biggest moment of your career. I can see the plaque behind you. Uh, WrestleMania 33, winning the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. Uh, hype or no hype? I think it's an obvious answer. Oh, absolutely. Hype, number, number one hype. That was, like you said, the... The moment of my career that was uh pretty cool we had like a a pretty good lead going into that one um to set the whole thing up i was able to uh work in one of my best friends in on that one and uh and robbie g and man that was just uh that was such a cool moment you know um in my first wrestlemania too so kind of come starting this thing off with a with a huge bang and yeah man that was um I mean, there's been a few times where, you know, like it just, you know, because, you know, wrestling, you know, some of some of these moments are so overly scripted. You, It's hard for you to really get caught up into them and enjoy them and appreciate everything that they are. That was one of the moments that really created just one of the most genuine authentic reactions that that i've ever had i mean top two or three three there and of course it was the number one moment in my career but yeah that was something special my family was there they all came in deep uh you know a lot of my friends came in it was in orlando where i was where i live um and yeah like you know it's just that that was pretty crazy man i was so excited that was that was something special we ran a little heavy on time which i i remember i was a little a little worried about that part because I'm always pretty, you know, a stickler for hitting my marks. But uh, that that was something else. I, the rest of the day was just kind of surreal. We were just kind of floating around like, you know, this is it. And I remember in my head afterwards, I was like, man, I hope this isn't the last big one. <laughs> that was the goal. It's like, man, we need more like this for sure. You can blame the security woman, right, for running over time. Oh man, that that made the whole spot so much better. Lisa, she's the best. Cause they actually were um, they were booing Rob at first. Cause you know how wrestling fans can be. They don't like outsiders too much. So I mean I understand it. I completely get it. I'm with them most of the time on it actually. But uh this one, this one was different, you know, because they they were gonna boo him and then when Lisa stopped him, they they took she stopped she took it away from him, so everyone realized how much they they really wanted to see the spot, even if they were booing him. So when she finally let him go, we were back to normal. We got the the cheers we wanted. The spot uh, fell into place as as planned. And yeah, man, the rest is history. But yeah, Lisa's the best. She saved the day. <laughs> Do you face much um, sort of animosity when you joined as an outsider? Yeah, I did. Um, I remember when I was first recruited, the man recruiting me told me that coming in from football and not earning your stripes within this industry, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to take it for granted. You might have to fight to defend and protect yourself. They're going to be gunning for you, cheap shotting, all this and that. Um, they're not going to want you here. Um, and I completely understood that, to be honest with you, because you know, I know for me, like, you know, we, we talked about the football thing. Like I was always a walk on, you know, like the non-scholarship guy, the guy that had been, you know, earning the stripes on the team. So when they'd sign these five-star recruits to come in and get literally handed and gift wrapped every opportunity. I mean, the same thing in the NFL too, it was just like, you know, I never took it out against the guy, but I certainly didn't appreciate it from the system. You know, it's like, yo, I'm here and I'm doing everything right. So I knew coming in, it was going to be a situation where 
some guys aren't going to appreciate this. NXT wasn't what it was. It was FCW. It was all homegrown talent, like career wrestlers, you know, no coming in as outsiders, you know, even me, Baron Corbin and this other guy, um, Brandon that started uh, in the NFL as well. We all kind of came in together and, you know, it's kind of one of those things where they told us, like, you, you three need to stick together because they're going to be coming for you. So, <laughs> do you think that's I, changing as time goes on? Uh, wrestlers sort of behind the scenes are they becoming more accepting of outsiders? You will. There, yeah. I mean, one, there's really no such thing as a homegrown talent anymore. You, how often do you see those guys? It's either guys that became massive stars on the indies, or guys that you know, like myself, came in from sports or you know, had a name of some kind before this and are starting over fresh, but guys just kind of coming in off the street that wanted to be wrestlers or had small names on the indies or something. You don't really, you don't really see those guys anymore. And, you know, I think guys that came from the indies are very understanding now that, that you need both. Like you can't just have a show full of guys that, that came you know, from, from small indies or even, you know, guys that came from, from the big indies, you need a mix. You need guys that come from, from every walk of life that can tap into every background. I think a lot of guys and a lot of fans don't think of that, that business side of the, uh, of the company where it's like you, you want guys that came from the NFL because now you can grow your NFL following anyone that watches football. Now there's synergies that you can create from the NFL itself and they can lead to corporate sponsorships and new business partners. And a lot of guys don't kind of go into the business and corporate side of that, which I always try to be, be cognizant of. Um, at the same time, you cannot have a guy, bunch of guys come in like me that have no idea what the hell they're doing and it's going to take years to get them to the point where you know we have a shot at being close to these indie guys i mean we got guys coming into nxt that have had full-on 10 20 year careers that are in the prime of your career how many years am i going to have to train from scratch before i get to that point i mean the show's going to have like 10 makeovers during that time it's uh you got to have both for each other to pick each other up and um, you know, for guys to create star power and, and really just try to have their their game come full circle. You talk about bringing other things to the table. And one thing that, that you brought to the table, certainly, was your ambassadorial role uh, in WWE Saudi Arabia shows because of your, your heritage. Um, how, do you, how do you feel about those shows, hype or, or not hype? The Saudi, show, the Saudi Arabia shows for me were always uh, very hype. Um, I have family that lives there. So for me, it was always a vacation. Um, I get to see, you know, reconnect with family I haven't seen in years. You know, I got to see, you know, my dad's older brother at a show who I hadn't seen since I was a little kid. I, I got to see my cousins I hadn't seen since I was a little kid. I got to meet meet their kids for the first time and see where they grew up and, you know, places my dad and my mom used to live. My parents met in Saudi Arabia. So, you know, for me, it was this was a dream come true. This was everything I wanted, you know, wrestling to be not only having these amazing entering moments, but being able to go on tour and, and see the world. I mean, those were, those shows were best case scenario for me. I know a lot of the, the other guys didn't share my sentiment here. Um, of course, there's no alcohol in, uh, in Saudi. So being able to go out and party and drink was not a thing that was available. So a lot of guys, uh, a lot of guys got bored, but I can say we always had the best catering at the hotels, uh, the most lavish hotel rooms over there. So it was it was a different kind of vacation, but but I loved them. I always thought they were great. And to that point, like the ambassadorial role, that was, yeah, something that I just kind of fell into. Um, there was very few guys that they used for those spots. I mean, me and Titus were always uh, the, the top two used in those roles. Um, you know, and that was something that I always loved and I think added value for me to the company. But sometimes I felt like I got a little too pigeonholed in being that guy where it detracted from things that I could have done in the ring or opportunities I might have had there. Because when you're trying to find limited spots for a bunch of guys, especially, you know, mid card guys or guys that were overdue for a push. I feel like sometimes it was like, all right, well, we'll give it to this guy because Mojo's our ambassador. He's already doing a lot of work for us. And after a while, you know, I, I loved that role, but it was like I didn't want to stagnate and have that 
you know, only be my thing. Sure. You would think it would sort of work the other way around and that if you have uh, ambassadors going to different countries, you would want to feature them prominently on your TV show. You would think that. And I mean, <laughs> they would always, uh, maybe they would use you when you were there, but they wouldn't really lead up. I mean, Mansoor, they do a great job with him. Um, they were doing a great job with him for the Saudi shows, but now finally they're doing a great job with him like year long, which is, you know, I've enjoyed everything he's been doing. Um, you know, recently that's another, you know, hardworking guy. I'm, I'm happy to see what's coming to him, but yeah, like you, you would hope everybody would have runs like him where it's, you know, going to lead into a, a big event like that, but that's, Unfortunately, not always the case. Sure. Fast forwarding a few years from WrestleMania 33 uh, onto WrestleMania 36. Hype or not hype? <laughs> Hold on. You got which one was 36 again? They all kind of 36. The Gronk coming off the stage as. Uh... Oh yeah, yeah, that was 36. <laughs> um, I want to. I mean, it was. The moment itself was hyped. Another moment with my buddy, you know, pretty much co-hosted Mania with him. We had a fun little spot. But I'm going to say not hype. Okay. Because I know the plans that were in place that got derailed. Um, I was doing my 24-7 title thing, which I was actually very excited about. I know a lot of people kind of shrug off that title. Um, I pitched to Vince this idea of being the first person to not run and hide with that title of kind of slowly trying to morph it back to be the hardcore title, me essentially taking the fun away from truth, truth, trying to take the fun back, but mixing in the hardcore element, not running for a facelift with this thing. And it can kind of be this battle back and forth of fun versus hardcore. And he loved it. Put the thing on me the next week. Um, and we had this pretty cool storyline um, set up with that, which was going to lead into um, a big thing at Mania, you know, really like hardcore style. Mike Rollis was going to join in on that or Riddick Moss. I mean, um, we ended up abandoning those plans because Rob wanted to come in and do something with us. And, you know, they gave us some space to actually come up with the plan. I mean, I kind of used Rob as a way to be able to throw a little more creative in on this one because it's usually out of our hands, but they were all about the plan that I pitched. And it was pretty cool because we were going to bring Rob in. We were going to do a little thing at Mania, a little hosting thing, but it was going to set up a match, a tag match with me and Rob at SummerSlam in Boston in it, where he's been playing football for the past decade. Uh, we were going to go over and then I was going to turn on him. I was going to get his brothers and his dad in on it. And uh, pretty much it was going to lead to a blow off match, a no DQ match in Saudi Arabia. Me, me versus him with his whole family there with the kind of thought being that I beat the crap out of Rob in front of his family in his hometown in Boston. He's going to come do the same to me in my, you know, in Saudi Arabia where my family's from and, and all that. So we had like this really cool plan in place with a lot more specifics to it. And unfortunately with the state of the world at that time, all of that got thrown out and it was more or less reduced to co-hosting with the 24 seven spot. And that was it. So that's such a shame. It was a cool moment. Who would, who would have uh, you been facing in, in the tag match at SummerSlam? Would that be true? We were, we were searching for that. I got to think it was going to be Miz and Morrison. Right. Um, you know, but we were also trying to find a tag partner for gender because we had that whole moment with them in the battle Royal at 33. So we, there, I think it was going to be something to there if we could find the right, you know, partner for gender, but either of those guys would have been perfect. Cause man, those guys are fantastic workers. They would have made Rob look like a million bucks and we had a good plan in place for that one. But so don't get me wrong. 36 was great. We had a great spot. It was fun. That clip went everywhere, of course, um, to our point earlier. That's why you bring in guys from the NFL, because the reach of those moments is just magnified. You know, now it's on ESPN and Sports Center, and, you know, all the sports channels every day constantly, you know, for months. Um, but, yeah, uh, I'm only going to say not hype because it could have been so much, so much more. Um, 
let's talk about you and Zack Ryder, the breakup of the hype, bro. So um, over on SmackDown, you have beaten by the Bludgeon Brothers, uh, after which you attacked Zack, um, leading to the split of the hype, bro. So you got the pre-show match on the Clash of Champions um, pay-per-view, which I think was a shame as well for that to be stuck in the, on the pre-show. You must have been gutted about that. That, that one hurt. That yeah. one hurt. Um, so the, the breakup itself, do you think it was... It was the right time to do that. Was it hype? Was it not hype? Uh, it was long overdue. This was uh, the breakup was very hype. So we we put this. It was Hunter's idea to put the hype bros together in the first place. It, it, I remember when he was when he was talking to us. He was like, "Yeah, we'll put Broski and you together. You know, you're you're the hype. He's the bro. I don't know. Maybe we'll call you the hype bros or something." He's like. Not that name. That name sucks. We'll come up with something better, but we'll call you, the, you know, something like that. And I just, we were cracking up about it later because, because of that. We debuted it on Snapchat. We were supposed to be on takeover, sitting together from in the crowd. I was just coming off of a soldier, shoulder surgery, um, and this was the first time they were going to see me. I really didn't want to be in a tag team. I always, like, wanted to be a singles wrestler. Um you know, I, I felt like when I had my shoulder surgery, I was in need of a reboot. You know, what I was doing on TV was getting quite stale, and I really wanted to add some wrinkles to uh, to my game. I came back, didn't really get that opportunity to put us with the hype, me with Zach, which, you know, I didn't want to be in a tag team, but I was also grateful for the veteran leadership. Um, he, um, he didn't want to be in it. I know that. He wanted to do his own thing, too. So we got two guys that we're trying to – trying to make it work, but what we did, it wasn't supposed to be an NXT for long. It was there a little longer than it should have been. We get called up to the main roster, but we were always kind of um, second fiddle to Gable and Jordan, who were the other baby face team that were drafted higher to SmackDown than we were. So we were all always trying to play a little catch up there. Never really had like, you know, it was always kind of like short, simple matches. So we were like, we, we didn't really want to do this from the start. We really did try everything to make it work. Um, we had totally opposite, um, you know, ideas and perceptions on what we wanted this team to be. Um, so when it was time to break up, yes, we were very ready for it to say the least and, and go off and do our own thing. We were supposed to go on a losing streak, a few, a few matches and, and do this. It turned into, I want to say like, six months of losing matches so it was so long overdue when it happened like we teased this thing just a ridiculous amount of time the only thing we had going for us was no one knew who was going to turn on the other and i think most people assumed it was going to be zach turning on me for sure um so it was it was great we were all for it we were hyped up about it we couldn't wait to uh you know to end this thing and start new opportunities we were excited for the feud um for me, I never once still, even now, had a real storyline in, in WWE, like a program that I could sink my teeth into, have multiple matches with somebody, have some promos and backstages with, and a match with some build for once. So we were pumped up. We are like, man, this is it. This is an opportunity for us to, to revamp our game. And unfortunately, it didn't happen that way. I turned on him. And then they put together this pretty cool um, package about it, which didn't air on TV because they said it was too long. And it aired on .com. So like our Snapchat debut, <laughs> you know, when we first put this thing together, it was just like such a wash, like a throwaway. And then we found out we weren't even on the main card. It was the, the kickoff match, which I always didn't hate because – being the first match out at the, at the you know, first match out at the at the night was, you know, it is a good spot. I mean, you want to make main event, but opening is also pretty dope. I never really hated that. But for, for this match, it was just like pretty frustrating. So me and Zach, we were, uh, we, we talked to each other. We we're like, Let, let's just go ham on each other on uh, social media. Let's, let's rip into each other. Let's say what we've been wanting to say to each other for a long time. And, and just go for it. Let's make this match physical. Uh, let's beat the crap out of each other. Of course, when you're the kickoff match, there's, you know, so many constraints. We couldn't really do anything on the floor. We had to have a basic match, not too many false finishes. You know, there there's rules to this. There's, there's handicaps. And, of course, there was a, a time limit. So 
you know, the match isn't quite what we wanted it to be, but yeah, the, the breakup, super hype, the, the blow up, not so hype. That's interesting that you say Zach didn't want to do it. You didn't want to do it either. Zach has, I guess, been fairly outspoken on Twitter. He's taken sort of shots at you and it all seems sort of very jovial and friendly. And I'm sure it is. But it's interesting to hear that you didn't want to do it either. You, did you have something in mind that you wanted to be doing as a singles guy? Well, I thought with my whole stay hyped uh, mantra, we could have done so much more there because the energy was undeniable. You know, it's you're, you're going to react one way or another when a guy's losing his mind that much. Um, you know, it, it did become polarizing, though, especially with the NXT crowd. Um, honestly, what I think it was when I when I started to uh, stagnate at that time was, I mean, I was doing the same match every every taping. I mean, I was grateful to debut that early, but my matches were written for me at the time. And, uh, you know, it was the same. It was the same moves. I remember we had a taping where we filmed four or five episodes and I wrestled three times that day and they had me do literally the exact same match move for move. And I was like. I don't know if you guys have realized this, but this is literally the same match. Like, can we, can we mix it up? Can we change some stuff? And it was one of those things where I was so new and I was trying not to ruffle feathers where they're like, just be grateful for this, this, this spot, you know, that you're in. It was like, you know, you know, I'm kind of like leaving the fans here, nothing to grasp onto outside of a energetic entrance. And of course I had the worst move set of all time with the, the rear view and the whoopee cushion, which <laughs> I pitched new finishing moves every single day. I pleaded with them to let me change it. Um, I only started doing those in the first place because I came in doing like this party boy character, which of course was kind of a part of my later stuff anyways. But I was full on party boy with the Zubas and just, you know, all that. And I thought those moves were funny. So like, you know, we were calling them like the flying tea bag and all this stuff. Like we were just joking around. Like we thought it was hilarious. And then piggybacked with my my dance moves that I was doing. And it was great. And then we became this, you know, I, I started doing the whole serious stay hype thing and they wouldn't let me change them. I think I hit big cast with the rear view on a, a dark match, but I literally jumped over his head. And I think Hunter saw it and made a comment to the producer I was like, man, holy crap, this guy can jump. And I think that was the reason why they wouldn't let me switch it. Um, but I could have come up with some other things that involved me jumping, I guess, but yeah, that one, that, that one kind of killed me right there. That was, that was tough. Uh, long story short, I come back and I was ready to take advantage of this, uh, stay hype. Let's rock. You know, I just had a surgery. I'm feeling good. I've had a little time away to get my, my, my head screwed on. Right. And I had all these ideas of things that we, you know, I wanted to do and that I wanted to be responsible for my own destiny to, you know, have everything in my control. Um, and then, yeah, they, they put me with Broski. So I was like, man, this is not what I wanted. But, you know, I, I was trying to look at the situation as a positive. I'm not going to complain about being tagged up with a guy that's been in the company forever, who, which you know, was supposed to fast track me to the main roster. You know, I'm not going to complain about my way in necessarily. Um, yes, you see it going differently. But at the end of the day, if you get there, you can't have too many complaints, I suppose. For sure. So fast forwarding a bit once again, um, the heel turn, the blue face paint, hype or not hype? This is the least hype thing I've ever done. <laughs> this is the worst. Where did that come from? Um, I was, I pitched, this came from a pitch from Vince again. Um, I tried not to go to his office too much unless I had something, you know, really good. I didn't want to be one of those guys that was showing up, you know, more or less harassing him every week, complaining about small things. Didn't want to be that guy, but I also didn't want to be one of those guys that was scared to go into his office and, and never talk to him. Cause I know he probably hates that probably more. Um, you know, and he had that open door policy. You just got to be prepared to wait there all day because he's a busy guy and, you know, you just got to wait your turn. I went in and I pretty much just had this pitch about, you know, using a mirror and, um, you know, pretty much berating somebody and really trying to get in someone's head and you don't know who I'm talking to. Um, you know, maybe you think it's broski or whatever, but I also had this idea of kind of combining that 
in a way with, you know, how everybody talks to themselves in a mirror to hype themselves up if they're brushing their teeth in the morning, you know, maybe, you know, before a set at the gym, before a big meeting, you know, everybody kind of looks in a mirror to focus up and, you know, charge themselves up. And I had this idea of kind of combining those two where, you know, I'm going after somebody, you aren't who you think you are, you know, you should be so much farther along, like real world stuff. And then you don't know who I'm talking to. Eventually you find out I'm talking to myself in a mirror. Um, it wasn't supposed to be like I'm psychotic and losing my mind, but it was supposed to be more like a reality check, like focusing up and, and whatnot. But that somehow became me turning into a psychopath. And uh, they had the idea to do something with my face. They were like, you come off too uh, eloquent when you speak. You sound too intelligent um, with your facial reactions. It's it's hard for people not to, to get with you or emote with you, which maybe the first thing I could see what he was saying, but the second thing I didn't really quite get, he's like, so we either want to put you in a mask or we want to do face paint. And I was like, ah, oh, face paint, please. I don't want to be in a mask at all. Screw that. Um, <laughs> so they had this idea for, it was supposed to be like broken glass. Uh, yep. I don't think one person saw it that way. Uh, I didn't see it that way. I am not an artist. You can't ask me to draw that on my face. I mean, I, I can't do it. Even at TV, I didn't, I wasn't the one that, that did it like either you know, someone in, in gimmicks or props or makeup, like we had a lot of people get this thing a shot. It just, you know, this, this was not the move. And it just, we did these mirror things, which were not the direction I was trying to take this. Um, but at least part of them were kind of interesting for a little bit. It's like, all right, what's happening here. But then we had, I had one match with Apollo in London. Uh, and then that was it the whole thing was like scrapped from the get go. And I was just like, Oh, this was a nightmare. <laughs> I painted my face up like a moron for no reason. I had to do this prep for weeks. We had to do this character that went nowhere. This isn't at all what I was pitching. What a disaster. Yes. Yeah, so that was the least hype thing I did in my career. How, no much, question. how much input do you have into the creative, especially like the backstage promos that you're talking about with the mirror? Was that all completely scripted for you? Uh, yes, for, uh, well, that's not true. So they gave me a little more control over the promos, like the actual verbiage, um, as far, like they, they revealed that I was talking to myself in the mirror from the very first one, which was not the point. Um, so I didn't have any control of that. Um, they shattered the, the mirror on its own. I wanted to be the one to shatter it. I know it's bad luck, but whatever. Um, and then they, they controlled the whole face paint thing and all that. So it was a bit of both. Um, at least I got to kind of control some of what was being written, which I think, you know, at least made it a little more intriguing because I knew what I was going through. So I was able to translate that a little better, but yeah, it's, um, generally speaking though, you have next to nothing, you know, they'll write these promos for you. Sometimes, you know, they'll take what you submit or what you write and try and edit and work that in. Of course, uh, sometimes if you write a monologue and they change just one sentence that can, you know, ruin the whole flow or direction or impact of a promo. But, uh, you know, guys that have been there way longer, you know, they'll have a lot more control over what they're doing. And of course, some people do get unscripted promos, but those are few and far between. So it gets tricky, man. You just, that's one of the arts is trying to learn how to navigate the system. And, you know, you really do have to analyze and weigh what's most important. Like if I can get one sentence in, what's it going to be? You know, if I can get one move in this match or one spot, what's it going to be? And, you know, for guys uh, that are in the mid card, you know, that's sometimes all you get. You should write a book, diary of a mid carder. <laughs> I, I think back to the the promos that you were doing um, that were all self shot. I think you're in the car leading up to the um, the, the Zack Ryder match, and you were on fire. You're a hell of a talker. Um, do they appreciate you doing stuff like that off your own back? I didn't hear a word from them about really? any of that. No, um, but I did notice the next week everybody started filming selfie promos on TV, and I wasn't one of them. So. Uh, I guess that was enough of a pat on my back where I knew there was a 
a pretty good thing. That promo went a long way for me, though. Um, you know, I remember some of the, some of the sites online were calling it promo of the year, and it didn't even come on, you know, TV. Uh, that was incredible. Yeah, and that was just oh man, that was frustrating for me because it's like, man, guys, I could have been doing this the whole time. Like, this is what I've been pitching for so long. Just give me the damn mic, like, please. You know, like, let me let me have a program with somebody because for all those people that were saying Mojo Raleigh was one note, the whole stay hype thing is just, you know, one note and that he's only got one level. It's like, give me the damn mic and give me a program where I can dive in and, and show people, you know, some range and what I can do. It was so frustrating. It's like, this is just something like I shot in my garage after a workout, you know, trying to build a promo, you know, a program because we had no TV time. Me and Zach, Zach was doing the same thing. I did. I think I shot two at them that week. I mean, the second one's definitely the better one in the garage. Um, but yeah, like that was, that was all we had. We were trying to make lemonade kind of thing. So yeah, for me, it was just, you know, Hey, I was very frustrated. It was like, yes, I could have been doing this the whole time, but obviously you know how good it was because you just, literally had everybody start doing these things immediately so um you know but that that's that's what it is sometimes that's how it breaks down you know i was never one of these guys that went out and complained online and you know tried to drum up problems outside of the company i kept all my stuff uh you know hush hush internally didn't want to be uh one of one of those guys so um, you know, maybe if I was, you know, I would have gotten a look maybe more like it would have pressured them because sometimes that works too, but you never know. And for me, you know, I guess I was just trying to stay out of trouble or whatever. For but, sure. It's yeah. a dangerous game, isn't it? it? It could benefit you, but it could go completely the other way. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's pretty wild. I mean, that's kind of the thing too, is meeting with Vince because some guys have gone in there for meetings and just had their asses handed to them because, you know, Vince is pretty blunt about things. If he hates an idea, he'll tell you. If, if you're not getting it done, he'll tell you. Um, you know, and sometimes you go in there and if he realizes, you know, that you've been quietly hiding, you know, in the ranks or, you know, he forgot about you, then you make him remember why he doesn't need you. That might be enough to, to get canned or, you know, end a push or anything to that extent. Sure. I mean, you were, you were there for what, since you signed it, nine years or so. You're obviously doing something, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, I think they just looked at me as one of those guys that was, here's a guy, he's super hardworking, he's always got an attitude, you know, maybe get, brings a little energy to this place, but he's also that ambassadorial role, he's a guy that we can use for sponsors, um, you know, it, I, I had no ill will with anybody in the company, so I think that helped keep me around a long, a long time, but I think the main the main reason I had as long of a run as I did was because Vince always knew how much potential I had, um, you know, at being an athlete. And, you know, he loved how much I was like breaking the records in the weight room and how I was constantly pushing. And I always went in with printed up notes, you know, short like a short version and a long version with something I could hand him, which I know he appreciated. So I think he always knew what he had. They just never used it which was always kind of strange to me it was like you think you'd give a guy a shot and all right sink or swim we're going to give you a legitimate shot here if it doesn't work you're out if it works we're going to catapult your career and I was always kind of waiting for that moment because for me it's like I didn't I didn't want to be one of these guys that was just here you know you know if you're gonna if I'm gonna be here don't make me an ambassador otherwise cut me make me an ambassador and let me do my thing outside of here you know it was always like you know use me or not so give me that sink or swim moment you know, I've made a career out of that in football. Like, I'd love to have that here. And just, you know, it was just kind of one of those things where I felt like I was just kind of floating around for a while. It was so strange. So that's actually why it's been it's been good to be out of the company now because, you know, I've only been out a few months and there's been just so much that I've had going on. It's been great. That's awesome. Uh, one of the one of the things that I, I, I took a quick look at your uh, your IMDb page, uh, page rather, and uh, Snake Eyes, you're in the new G.I. Joe film. That's awesome. How did that come about? That was great, man. Um, the director found me. Uh, Robert Schwenke found me and um, uh, him and the producers, I guess they knew they wanted a wrestler for this this role. So they literally went to WWE site. And I don't think any of them. Um, I don't think most of them. Some of them were. Uh, I don't think most of them were wrestling fans. So they literally just 
went to YouTube and Instagram and looked up every guy on the roster and they picked me and they called WWE and they were like, can we borrow Mojo for a week? Um, actually it was like four or five days or something. I flew there between TVs. Um, and yeah, went up to uh, Vancouver and, and shot that thing. It was such an awesome opportunity. I accepted it on the spot. It was great. Um, got to go up and be a part of a franchise that I've been watching since I was a little kid. I mean, it's been, it's been pretty cool, man. Like I've been able to, uh, to live out some serious dreams here. And I know it was a small role, um, but it, the, the scene I'm in is pretty dope, man. It's a, uh, it's a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you know, pit fight with snake eyes himself. So with the lead, the first time you see the lead. So it's uh, right off the jump and it's, it was cool, man. It was an opportunity of a lifetime and experience that, you know, I certainly treasure. And it was a great learning experience for me too, to go on the, the set of a, a major, you know, motion picture and, and really study and learn. And, you know, my mind was just racing the whole time, just trying to meet everybody, pick brains and just kind of take it all in. It was, it was awesome. And now it's out in theaters. I got to take my, uh, friends and family we got a big old party bus and went to the premiere and uh yeah got to see myself on the big screen it was awesome that's awesome i saw yeah your, your opening shot of the trailer too that's it's yeah. really cool really really cool um so we'll, we'll move on now to uh, it's, it's more hype or not hype but we're going to go through some names people that you have encountered uh, worked with throughout your wwe career some from nxt some from the main roster some from behind the scenes um we'll open with uh with with chad gable chad gable hyped in the ring not hype in real life <laughs> really he's a, so? he's a quiet guy he's pretty mellow you know he likes to you know kind of keep to himself very hard worker um but yeah in the ring he's hyped all the way i mean that's one of our really underrated guys i'm, I'm glad he's uh got a run going with otis right now because there was a few of us man that were just kind of like mid card guys that were kind of floating around and we were just like, we get like these little semi pushes and, you know, then we disappear for a year and, you know, like Gable was one, you know, breeze was one, Apollo was one. We were like these main event guys that we go out every week on main event and try and kill it. And, you know, we worked hard against each other and we didn't take that spot for granted. We really tried to, uh, you know, swing for the fences as much as we could. Of course, it's the first match of the night. So it was, uh, you know, a lot of handcuffs on that one as well. A lot of things we couldn't do um, that, you know, a more primetime spot would be be allowed to do. But, yeah, Gable, Gable's a great guy. Very uh, not hyped in person. But, yeah, he's a hyped up. He's hyped up in the ring for sure. But a good guy. Good guy. Good guy. Awesome. Uh, Jason Jordan. Jason Jordan. I, rinse and repeat, brother. Uh, you know, very, another quiet, uh, mellow guy. Um, one that really... I think it was good. He was getting a push before he got hurt. The kind um, of angle stuff, yeah. Yeah, I mean that was the interesting angle, by the way. But <laughs> should have been. I guess if you're going to go in an angle, it doesn't hurt to go in with Kurt Angle and be his son. I mean, at least everybody was talking about it, which is sometimes the most important. Um, mm -hmm. I think he would have had a much bigger run if um, if he didn't get hurt. But then he became a producer, and now he's like lead producer or head producer or whatever i mean he's killing it he showed his worth 10 times over that that was really cool to see for me as his buddy uh somebody that started you know barely after him and was there for the come up and you know uh introduced him to his wife and whatever we've been buddies for a long time i mean that guy was kind of a sleeping giant so another one very mellow quiet in person but hyped career not hyped in person <laughs> two guys you work with lots in nxt enzo and cass Oh, man. Hyped up all the way. Enzo's a psycho. Enzo <laughs> and I were roommates when we first started. Oh, really? When we first started, we moved in together. He was another football player. Um, he was a guy because I reached out to the people that were, you know, signing me or whatever. And I was just like, hey, I'd like to, you know, I want a roommate. I want to have a buddy, someone I'm on the same schedule with, you know, save costs because we were making next to nothing. I was losing a thousand dollars a month to be there in the beginning um but yeah Enzo was my roommate we went out like and you know we we piggyback off the football thing and we like party together and he was all hyped up and Enzo's actually um I have Enzo's responsible for me having a fade actually is that right is this Enzo was really good creatively and I don't 
I mean, obviously he had a hell of a, a run, but he was really good about like backstage giving people um, like tips on, you know, how to like market themselves or ideas for promos or, or ring gear. Cause you know, I'm not an, I'm not artistic at all. So like ring gear, I never knew really how to create like ring gear or what I should be doing or, you know, what I could best do to, to handle that side. I mean, of course I knew how to, I came up with stay hyped and knew how to market that and whatnot, but like, you know, as far as appearance goes, he was like kind of a whiz kid with that. So we were in London actually before that takeover and they, he, he was the one that was able to bring us in a barber for the shows. The girls always had their makeup staff and their hairdressers and all this, but the guys had nothing. And Enzo was able to uh, convince Canyon to bring in a barber. He's like, bro, you look like a Lego block. You need to, you need to do something with your hair. Cause I just had like uh, the clippers and I'd buzz the, the one or the two all the way around. He's like, you need to go with a fade, bro. I'll just sit down. I'm going to tell him what to do. And I did the fade and I was like, man, this looks way better. And I've been rocking a fade ever since. So until he tells me how to go about my hair next, maybe I'll just keep it this way. But leopard yeah, print coming soon, this... right? What's that? Leopard print coming soon, I imagine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whose idea? Uh, you're talking of ring gear. Whose idea was the the blue ring gear that you had on the, the heel run with the, the blue face paint? You, you switched um, it up. Yeah, so... At one point, I was pitched to uh, be in a singlet, a wrestling singlet, which singlet, which I didn't want to do because I wasn't, I wasn't a wrestler like by by trade. So I was kind of against that. I actually posted it on my Instagram recently, and I was like, "Look at this singlet! I thought it looked stupid. I was like, "Look how dumb it looks!" And just all the comments were like, "Bro, this is actually a good look." I was like, "Oops." <laughs> Oh, well, but it wasn't me. So I didn't want to wear anything that wasn't me. This was kind of like a happy medium between the two. Um, it was very MVP-esque. Mm -hmm. MVP was a guy that I started kind of uh, watching and studying a bit because I thought there was a lot that I could pull from him. And then, of course, he came back to the company. So I was like, abort. <laughs> Got to abort them. He's going to come back for his stuff. But, um, yeah, like that, I, I kind of was with that. Um you know, for me, there was always this struggle because I've never been one of these guys that had like an eight pack, you know, and I literally had the best cardio in the company. It was something I prided myself on. But no matter how much cardio or how much dieting I did, I could never, you know, get that bottom of the eight pack. I was 330 pounds in the in the NFL, like I have like stretch marks and stuff. It's just hard to get to that point, you know, Um so for me, it was like, ah, you know, I want to wear trunks and I want to showcase this. You know, I'm trying as hard as I can, but, you know, not everybody's going to look like they have, you know, not everybody's going to have an APEC. People are going to look more natural, you know, and, and, you know, I never took any steroids or performance enhancing things. I was adamantly against that my whole career. I didn't want to, you know, of course, cheat to have that. But for me, I always thought people watching at home, like, even though they'll be the first ones on Twitter to bury you. It's like, you know, we need to show that not everybody has to have an eight pack to be successful in life, that bodies come in, in different shapes and sizes. And I always like we never tapped into that on TV. I don't know if I've actually ever spoken about that um, publicly. But for me, like that was kind of the thing. I was like, you know, I want to stick to trunks or the bikers and kind of go with that route. So wearing uh, the jumpsuit or whatever we want to call it in the end, um, that was suggested to me to to, you know, just add a, you know, a wrinkle, change my appearance a little bit. And I gave it a shot, you know, wasn't really as stagnant at the time. Anyways, why not change things up? But for that, I was like, Ooh, this could be dangerous. Cause now I can eat whatever I want to eat. I can drink whatever I want to drink. I can do whatever I want to do. And I'm like, <laughs> I gotta be careful here. I'm gonna lose my appearance. But also it did allow me to like bulk up a little bit if I wanted, if they wanted a bigger dude, just to, you know, appearance wise, I guess that was, you know, something that they wanted. So whatever, if that's what they want, I'll, I'll, I'll try and find a way to make it work. I wasn't going to complain or say no. Never said no to anything my whole career. I wasn't about to start then. Sure. You, you talk about getting buried on Twitter. And I've noticed just from being tagged in so much stuff regarding yourself, you get it hard on Twitter or you got it hard <laughs> on, on Twitter and Instagram, social media generally. How does that affect you? In the beginning, it was concerning. Uh, Frustrating, sure, but it was more concerning because uh, I don't know if the, the fans realize how much power their tweets have, uh, but the company sees everything. And there's a social media report that's compiled 
after every TV where they uh, track all the tweets and see if they were generally positive or negative, how many views, how many retweets, likes, all that crap. Um, and they're delivered for every segment. And that's how they dictate, you know, TV time moving forward uh, in a way. So in the beginning, when I was really, I don't want to say self-conscious, but I was definitely more sensitive about what was being said because this was the start of my career. I knew how important this was. I knew I was getting a push, you know, brand new and I really, really wanted it to work out. Um, you know, you got to listen to them. I don't like shrug up. I, I read them all. I read the comments, you know, like I want to see what people are saying about me. Cause I mean, in my, it's my opinion that it's, it's your job. You know, you need to know how people are perceiving you. The frustrating part comes in when they're tweeting things that you can't control, like scripts that you were given, you know, uh, for me, you know, like the move said, it was just every week in the beginning it was like, why is this guy, using a rear view and a whoopee cushion. Like we can't get behind this guy because of it. For me, it's like, oh my God, I want to change it too, but there's nothing I can do about it. Now, when people were tweeting like, this guy's green as grass in the ring, that's stuff I do need to read. You know, that's stuff that's on me, you know, like regardless of if the moves were put together for me, it's still me executing them. It's still me selling, uh, which was the hardest thing for me in the beginning because in sports, you no sell all, all weakness. Uh, so you got to learn to undo that. And that takes time. Um, but for that stuff, it was like, man, I need to get this right. So those I'd read tweets like that and go put in like an ex another extra session, you know, three more hours in the ring that day. I've already been there all day. Um, so I think that stuff was important. So, yeah, it was it was important, I think, when when it's something that you control can control. It's very frustrating when it's something that's that's out of your hands. Um, but it also was cool to see the things that I did that actually, you know, gained acceptance for me, because when we would go do shows, families and kids and kind of people outside of that wrestling bubble loved me. Like they loved me. I was always their favorite, you know, with the energy it was easy for them to get with, but the wrestling community, well, I was always like their least favorite, you know? Um, so that was always something that I, I had to be aware of, but it was cool to see like things like the, the promo in the garage where, you know, accounts that I've literally seen bury me nonstop for, you know, several years at the point. They're like, man, this guy, this guy turned me today or this I, I got was I stand by Mojo Raleigh today or whatever it was. It was, it was cool to use as like a, a, a tracking mechanism over the years. Which must make it even more frustrating uh, when then after, uh, you know, you get bumped to the pre-show or whatever. So finally, people are getting on board with you. They're taking taking notice um, and then a creative decision is made to not utilize that momentum, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm coming off uh, negative right now or making excuses or complaints or anything. Um, for, you know, I'm very, very grateful for my time in WWE nine years in. You know, I even had a conversation about this with Fandango at one point. He's just like the most you know, positive, but he has his head screwed on better than anyone I've ever seen. It's like in my career, I got to have moments that people that wrestled their entire lives never got to have, you know, guys that were far better wrestlers than me. Um, and I got to have some moments that, that were unbelievable. So I'm grateful for those. And overall, my, my career with WWE was just a massive win, a massive plus, um, you know, that being said, do I think it could have gone, um, way better. Yes. Do I, I think it almost would have been harder for with everything that I was bringing to ta the table and uh, the work that I put in, I think it would have been harder to, to, to do less than I did. So yeah, seeing moments like that where they literally just got a sneak peek of what I could do. Um, you know, it was pretty, pretty devastating <laughs> mentally, man. It's like just so frustrating. It's, you know, you, you really do have to, stay hyped mentally and again this was part of my mantra i literally live by to not let that break or destroy you or, or weigh you down it's like you know this is your blueprint here this is literally your audition right here for something better and if it's not if it's not going to go that way if you know if they don't if they can't commit the time or the attention or whatever it may be to, to giving me a shot then you know, it's no hard feelings. You know, you guys got a hundred guys on that roster that are also fighting for a job, you know, 
you do your thing, let me go do mine. And if our cross, you know, if our paths cross in the future, once I've shown you in other ways what my value is, then, you know, maybe we come back. If not, then I keep doing what I'm doing and it's a win for everybody because I do not want to be one of these guys that wakes up when he's 40 or 50 and, you know, has more, you know, you have the paycheck to show for it, but nothing outside of that. That's not very, you know, rewarding and fulfilling. You know, I don't want to be more or less a prisoner for 20 years, someone that's been kept down. It's like, you know, let's let's both cut our losses and, and move on. We're grateful for the time we've had. We both added value to each other. Let's call it a day. For sure. And I mean, there's still plenty of time to achieve some of these goals that maybe you feel like you didn't achieve in WWE. You're not yeah, done with absolutely. wrestling, are you? No, I'm not done with wrestling. I will say I am taking some time off from Mm -hmm. in-ring. Otherwise, it's, you know, not not enough time has passed. I haven't done enough outside of here yet to show them in the wrestling world what they're missing, Uh, whether that's WWE, AEW, um, you know, New Japan, like literally anywhere. I I want everybody to know what, what they've missed out on. And for me, it's, I feel like I'm doing that already because, you know, Snake Eyes came out and that was received very well. You know, how many of uh, how many wrestlers have been in a movie like that, no matter how big the role is? Granted, no one has time to be in a big role if they're with the company. It's just not going to happen with the filming schedule. Um, you know, and I've been hosting TMZ Sports, which has been awesome. That's like a major gig um, on TV every day, getting more screen time than I did in the company. And then uh, I started a talent management company, repping a bunch of... Uh, a bunch of the guys for marketing opportunities, appearances, really everything. And, you know, that's already been amazingly successful from the jump. And it's already kind of the talk of the town. I certainly know that WWE is aware of that. They just, you can't ignore it with some of the names that, that we're working with, Um, you know, and I've been out of the company three months and I can't really talk about yet. Some of the uh, exciting projects I have yet to come, but for me, it was like, Holy crap this company, like what my career in this company made me think that I was a, a mid Carter. It's like, that is not the case. Like I was always so much more before I got here and it took three months to get all of this done leaving. It's like, for me, that was a huge pat on the back. It's like reminding me what I'm capable of and what I can do. So it's been, it's been fun, man. And like with, with some of the stuff I'm, I'm working on right now, that's going to be coming out like this. This is huge stuff. There's no way this isn't going to help me get a much bigger run where whenever I come back to wrestling, you know, wherever that is. That's all. It's it's so cool to see you so energized. As as a man, who, you're always energized, but you, <laughs> you seem really super on it. I'm not going to ask you to name names or, or anything like that, but have you had any sort of conversations with any other promotions at this point? Uh, no. Okay. Um, I, I made it pretty clear that I, I wanted some time off from wrestling. I have been comp- contemplating, um, you know, maybe coming in and like doing some managing or hype man work for somebody. Of course, it's harder to do that when because I'm probably yeah, my man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's harder to do that. I always pitched being a manager in WWE. Uh, you know, I didn't want to only uh, manage, you know, but kind of having like a faction and being the mouthpiece and representing, but you know, they always said it's, it's hard to manage guys that you're bigger than, you know, it's kind of backwards. Um, I'd I'd be open to some things like that, I suppose. But again, I, I, I really haven't reached out to anyone. I've made it clear for anyone that has inquired about me that, uh, you know, I'm not wrestling at this time. Um, you know, I, I got a plan in place and, you know, for me to just jump right back in, um, that that's not the move you like i said you want to take some time build your name and, and then come back when it's when it's right awesome uh, i'm very conscious of your time so we're going to breeze through some of these hype or not hype uh names uh, alexa bliss a woman who you're very very familiar with hyped up i love to creep on her i've seen I've i love seen. to creep on her hype uh the the former rusev miro see this is going to be tough for me i don't know how to say not hype to somebody I mean, that Zack Ryder is not hyped. That's probably the only person I can think of that sucks in my mind that I could bury right now. Feel free. The, the floor Are we yours. talking about careers or personalities here? Personalities, let's, let's I think more so. Oh, personalities? Okay, let me amend my uh, previous ones. Then we're going to say Jason Jordan, not hyped. Uh, Chad Gable, not hyped. 
Enzo's hyped, but Cass is not hyped. Alexa Bliss, it was not hyped, but now that she's with Ryan Cabrera, he's hyping her up. There, she used to be a homebody. Now she's leaving the house and getting out there and getting all crazy with it. Um, sorry, and then you said who just now? Rusev. Rusev. Rusev's not hyped either. Rusev's kind of like a chill, mellow guy as well. Unless you get him at a soccer game, then he's the most hyped. The, the, the next name on my list here is the man that you just mentioned, Zack Ryder. I'm, say what you will. Uh, not hyped, scumbag, uh, slash piece of crap. <laughs> <laughs> you keeping close contact? What, what do you think about the uh, what do you think about the deathmatch stuff he's doing now? Goodness, I didn't think he had him in, uh, had it in him. Where was that when we were tagging together, Broski? Right. Oh, Nothing. We always say that the feud that never began will never end. <laughs> we we never got into our feud. It was the kickoff match. They never hyped it up on TV. We never got any. Uh, screen time with it but it's like the longest running rivalry in wrestling because we are still burying each other to this day i even represent him in my company uh, i mean obviously he's doing most things himself you know my, my guys work non-exclusive so everybody does their own thing we just bring them some some work on the side when they can so we can just build everybody up um and i'm still burying the guy and i work with him so <laughs> we can't expect to see you in a, in a in a death match environment anytime soon then hell no no i mean shoot i'm not doing any kind of match more or less that right <laughs> i'm not saying i would never do a death match because i would love to do you know i'd love to have one good one uh i don't want to be the great guy the guy that makes a career out of that no thanks uh but i don't know man if i go out there and love it because, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of a psycho like that. If I go out there and see real blood, that's going to, like, really get in my head. Like, it's going to hype me up, and I'm going to probably love it. So I'm actually kind of scared to do one in case I, <laughs> I do like more. But that's yeah, off the gross. Man. I, didn't, I didn't know he had it in. Too right. Uh, Seth Rollins, a guy that you had one of your longer TV matches with, it went 11 minutes or so on Raw for the IC title. Yes, that was definitely my best TV match. Um uh, Seth is the man. The only thing I didn't like about that match was that it was with Seth. So no one would say, oh, oh, Mojo can go. It's more, man, Seth can show anybody. It takes two match. to tango, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does take two to tango. Um, Seth was incredible. Um, it was awesome to see, too, because, you know, with some guys, and sometimes I, I try not to be this way, but sometimes it's unavoidable. Uh, you know, you sit there planning a match all day. And, of course, the constraints change and, and the script changes all the time, so then you got to redo it. But Seth was one of these guys who's like, you know, he had so much to do that day. He's like, hey, we'll, we'll chat like 10, 15 minutes before we go out there. And that was one of the only times that I've been able to have a match like that. And I loved it. You know, you go out there and you're not thinking as much and trying to remember spots. You're just doing it. And, man, that was, that was great. I mean, I, that was the day where I was like, man, I'm going to get a rub after this there's no way you know the promo went well and i showed that i could hang with you know one of our best guys and you know if not the best in ring guy and then yeah you know i think internally they probably just wrote it off like all right you know that was all on seth kind of thing and it was my raw debut so it was overall i was very grateful for that it was a great match um Again, I feel like if we even got to do one of those on a pay-per-view, it would have been, you know, leagues even better than that. Um, but, yeah, overall, I was grateful for that. And to answer your question, Seth Rollins, another guy that's not hyped, another quiet, internal, kind of relaxed, relaxed guy. Unless you get him talking about the Bears, who suck. Uh. Go, back, go. <laughs> uh, R-Truth. R-Truth's hyped up. So. R-Truth is hyped. <laughs> Love truth. He's so funny. Great attitude. He's one of those guys, um, and a lot of the talent do this, is if you're having a go a bad day, go go sit and hang out with Truth for a bit. I don't know if I've ever seen him in a bad mood. Um, I, he took uh, the 24-7 title, which was supposed to be a joke, and made it the most entertaining title, the most talked about title out of all of them at one point. Um, and he's found ways to continue to make it entertaining when it's been more or less the same gag for years now, you know, more than two years. I don't know how long that thing's been around and he's still finding ways to, to make it uh, worthwhile and must watch. So hats off to him. And yes, he's hyped up, hyped up for sure. John Laurinaitis. 
<laughs> That's a hot topic on these days, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, as a guy, yeah, he's pretty hyped up. He comes in every day and he's, you know, um, you know, I'm blessed to be here, you know, you know, always in a, we're living the dream, you know, kind of, kind of thing. And, you know, I used to think in the beginning that he was just saying it, but sometimes when you say something like that and you, you speak positivity, uh, positivity repetitively, you speak it into existence. So I genuinely believe that when he's coming in every day and he's saying, you know, oh, blessed to be here, happy to be here kind of thing that he, that he means it. And I'm kind of the same way. So we always kind of, you know, reverberated off of that, I suppose. But yeah, he's, he's a pretty hyped up guy. One that may be a little bit more difficult um, because there are multiple members, but something that maybe you were going to be a part of at one point, Retribution. I was never supposed to be a part of that. Um, let's see who's in that thing. So you got uh, Dijakovic. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Mia Yim. He was he was always pretty quiet to me. I mean, of course, like some of these guys, I was already, you know, on the main before I uh, before I met him. So when I'd see him, it would be quick segments like seeing him in the gym or something like that and passing at the performance center. But he's always seemed like a pretty quiet to, guy to me. So he's not hyped. Um I don't remember their their so, reckoning name. Just Brendan going back the um the uh the reports that were sort of circulating about you being a part of that or maybe you filmed something with them under a mask. Did any of that happen at all? I think no, none of that happened. I literally never did anything with them. Um I don't know if I was ever suggested for that. Now it's possible internally <clears throat> they had an idea to put me with that. I actually made a pitch. I submitted a, a, a sheet of pitches, actually, because I was like, man, just pick one. I'll take I'll do any of these. There's like eight on there with pictures and everything. Reckoning uh, or um, uh, retribution was similar to one of the pitches I had. I don't know if maybe there was an idea for me to be a part of it or lead it or maybe they got the idea from from me in the beginning. I don't know. So if, if there was a tie to that, it had to have been an internal thing because I definitely didn't know anything about it. I might have tweeted once, like teasing, like joking after like the reports came out that I was a part of it just to kind of mess around. But yeah, that was that was never something that I was tied to. So was the pitch that you made a sort of anarchist group similar to Retribution? Yeah, um, I hate to say it and I don't want this to be perceived the wrong way, but I submitted a bunch of pitches with that were just a wide range of feasibility and just, you know, how many, like there were some that were really out there and some not so much. Um, the retribution I thought was, was the pitch I liked the least personally, but I thought it was the one they'd go for the most because it was a little more in line with what they've done in the past. Sure. Uh, and it's more. the one they ran with. So, hey, man, I mean, the guys know in the locker room, too, you know, you can come up with this outlandish pitch for you to win the title overnight. But if the odds of them going with it are, are, are very slim. It must so. be it must be kind of frustrating for you to pitch something and then that be given to someone else. Does that happen a lot? Um, yes, I am not as much. The promo thing, when I actually filmed it and put it into the universe and it was received so positively, and then that concept was given away, that's frustrating. But for me at the time, uh, I, I always tried to look at things from a business sense. That's you know what my background is too. But if I submit a list of pitches and I haven't been on TV in a year, yes, I'm very frustrated um, that they're not using me. But at the same time, like, if you want to essentially use me as a writer and you're going to pay all my bills to make a pitch that you're just going to give to somebody else, at least you didn't take it from me while I've already been doing it. You know, like, that's a little different. Um, so I didn't take too much offense to that one, especially because I didn't really necessarily want to do it. Um, I think that group could have been cool i think they had a lot of talent there in place that um they really could have worked with some guys in that group that can really go 
um, it just came off a little uh, different, I suppose. I know, I'm, I, I mean, they probably had higher hopes for the thing too. Um, and it's good to see what um, I believe, what, what's Brendan's uh, retribution name again? I, oh, with the dreads? Uh, Mace. Remember? Mace, that's it. Yeah, Mace and T-Bar. I mean, it's good to see. I like their tag team. It's almost like a Bludgeon Brothers feel, like two monster guys that can that can go. I think they're – I haven't really been watching that much recently. I've been trying to focus on other things. But, um, you know, I think they're getting a run as a tag team, at least last I saw. So, yep. hopefully they continue with it. I mean, two big guys that can go. I mean, Mace was – I think he was a fourth-round pick in the NFL, and he's a big dude. Like, you know, he's got the pedigree in the background and – I think everybody in the wrestling world knows what uh, T-Bar can do in the ring. So, sure. yeah, ho hopefully they get a run. Bringing out the big guns for the final two. Uh, Triple H? Um, I'd say he's somewhere in the middle. You know, he's not, like, bouncing off the walls like some of our guys, but he's also certainly, like, not not hyped, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you he's keep in contact? Conversation. Any, con that? any conversation with him since you've left? Have you kept in contact at all? No. Um no, I've I've only spoken to I've spoken to very few people in the company since I've left um, for a couple different reasons. But yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm fresh out. You know, it's a few months. That's uh, you know, there's kind of some stuff going on behind the scenes too that needed to be resolved and whatnot. So there's only been a few people I've spoke with there, but um, he, he's not one of them. But while I was there, you know, like uh, you know, he was always pretty energetic, but he wasn't like bouncing off the walls. My my little segment I had with him and Cole when we were doing commentary for a bit was <laughs> the best. One of I my love favorite. that. That was the, the first like COVID era SmackDown, right? It, it, it was so fun. It, it looked like you two were best pals. We were having a great time. You know, these were things that was just like, man, I can't believe I've been here nine years. And we're, you know, we're still like tapping into stuff like this. This is things we could have been doing the whole time. That mentality, me and Hunter there messing with Cole was everything I wanted the hype bros to be, you know, not everything in ring, just, you know, out of the ring, gooning up. Zach could even be the straight man if he wanted to like no selling all this stuff, but like kind of that sort of interaction and those kind of segments where everything I wanted that team to be, of course it wasn't, but yeah, it was fun. I mean, it, you know, Hunter will get uh, hyped up and he's really good about mirroring people when he's uh, doing segments with them and, uh, and whatnot. So I put him in the middle if I have to tilt it one way, I'll go ahead and give him give him the hype nod. What a nod, what a nod. And uh, finally, Vince McMahon. Oh, yeah, Vince is hyped. <laughs> Vince, is, <laughs> Vince is hyped for sure. Um, you, you just talk to him. I mean, even when he's trying to be mellow, you know, especially with just the way he sounds and the, the way his voice sounds and whatnot, like, he's just a hyped up dude. And I mean, you know, there's a guy that stays hyped right there. He never sleeps. You know, he's always doing... 10,000 things at once. Honestly, I have no idea how, you know, he gets it all done. I know people online will try to bury him for, um, you know, being disconnected from the product or, or whatever it may be. I mean, when you're doing as many things as he is, I mean, it's, there's no way you can remember every single little conversation and everything that's happening within, within your company. I mean, he, he does remember a lot of those things, which is kind of shocking, but you know, that's why he has, this this corporation there's so many people that work for him is because he can't expect one guy to do and remember everything so you know a lot of times he gets heat for uh things that i think are out of not out of his control because he controls everything of course but like things that he just wasn't aware of or things that he wasn't directly facilitating so do you think there's but, any yeah, truth he, to that, that that sort of perception that there is a disconnect between vince and what's happening on screen or even behind the scenes um I want to say no. Yes, I mean, in a way, he can't be up to speed on everything. I mean, what he didn't he just turn like 76 yesterday or the day before or something? So, like, he's not going to be up to speed on, you know, he can't watch enough TV to know what's going on in the, in the real world outside of wrestling, you know, to kind of create synergies there. That's why he has a team of people who are supposed to do that for him. Um, He's direct, directly involved in every aspect of the business, so it gets tough to, um, 
you know, to, to chime in on what can be little things that of course can become big things later. Um, yeah, it's just, I, I don't know. It's kind of, it's kind of tough for him to, uh, to be expected to do, to do everything. But one thing I will say uh, about Vince that he can get a bad rap for, but I don't think he should is he's the big picture guy. You know, he isn't really concerned with, um, you know, what every individual fan's going to think because he has to make decisions that can be tough uh, for the betterment of the company. So bringing in like mainstream celebrities for that outside boost or trying to, you know, create partnerships with, um, you know, networks or brands that may not be as in line with the wrestling world, but, you know, hopefully we'll get us back to or get them back to the times of the Attitude Era when literally everybody watched wrestling and it wasn't as much of a, you know, of a cult following, then he's got to make decisions like that. And it's hard for people to to see that on a wrestling level and not um, and not react adversely to that. One thing that I've said recently um, is, to be honest, in, in my opinion, I don't, and I'm not saying they said this because they've never once said this to me, but if I'm looking at it from how they look at things, I'm not so sure it matters if Raw or SmackDown is good if it's or if it's awful because they're so diversified and they have so many different product lines and, and uh, lines of business they work in that wrestling fans only really watch wrestling now, which is a shame because when real world people find out uh, what – our guys are capable of and what goes into a show they're immediately captivated and hooked it's just we lost all those people so wrestling fans are going to watch wrestling regardless of if the show is awesome or if it's not that great i mean the ratings will fluctuate somewhat but they're going to watch so sometimes you got to do moves to you know get back that audience that we've lost in recent decades and you know i've been all for moves like that you know because i can't tell you how many friends i had that didn't watch wrestling before, before I started doing it. And they came to a show and they found out what we go through. And I mean, these are guys that played in the NFL, played in the NBA that are major Hollywood celebrities. And they're like, dude, I could never do this gig. This is the most involved, crazy atmosphere I've ever seen in my life. And whereas I never could do this and never want to do this because it seems like the most stressful thing ever. I'm like immediately hooked and want to know everything that's going on in this business now. Like it's, so if you got to make a move like that to, to get that audience back, I'm all for it. For sure. And I mean, some of the biggest successes in wrestling, you go all the way back to the rock and wrestling era. Uh, it was all about these outside sort of collaborative products and, um, it's what got a lot of people into wrestling is, is the, the, the crossover appeal, I guess, and those relationships mm. that they had with the likes of MTV. So I think maybe sometimes it is a bit of an unfair criticism. So, uh, Dean, that's that, that's it. This has been an absolute joy. I, I, I've been looking forward to this so, so much. Uh, is there Me anything... more than you, pal. Awesome. Is there anything that you want to you wanna plug? Um, no, uh, pretty much to say thank you. I mean, not only to you, because you really have been a driving factor in my career like literally i have a lot of uh, you know i have my share of big fans that support me in everything i do but as far as someone with a voice that can really enact change in a career i think you made more of a difference in my career than, than you know i mean you've driven your entire segment your entire audience um you know to kind of give me a second shot or take a closer look at me when it's very easy not to and someone that was in the position that was that I was in. And I, I can tell you firsthand that, you know, your support, you know, made a difference in my career, not only to me personally, but, you know, professionally, you know, the following you, you helped create for me, um, helped me get some opportunities, no matter how big or how small they were, you know, in the ring and on TV. So I thank you for that. I think everyone that, that follows you, you know, wherever you go, wherever you've been over the years, um, you, you know, you have a very dedicated fan base and, you know, I'm very grateful to them as well. Uh, I see the tweets, I see all the comments. I'm very involved in my social media and try to respond to everybody, whether that's a 
a like on a tweet or responding directly to a comment on any Instagram post I do. I see them all and people love you and they love me because I'm friends with you. So it's been, it's been awesome to see. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you to, to all of those people. Um, thank you to the people that buried me too. That might disagree with you. Those, those comments help, you know, more than, you know, I, re I read them and it's been good to not only toughen me up, but also use that as a learning tool and become better. So, brother, you're the man. No, you this are. Right. The so the, the, the reason, as I said at the beginning of, of this video, that I sort of latched on to you, if, if you will, is because you seem like a really good person and you're so unbelievably talented too. So thank you for the entertainment and thank you for what you've done. And it's been it's been such a pleasure chatting. I've actually, uh, I should have probably put these on at the start, but... Um, I managed to get a pack of these from <laughs> www.shop.com um, and if I can get them off, which I can't. Man, um, they're there. They'll be on after the show. Yeah, Thank they're, you they're, ever so those much. Those are old, so. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Bro, this, I'm telling you, this was the number one interview I've been looking forward to do this entire time. Me too, man. Um, this, this was the one. I mean, even from uh, the moment of my release, I always knew this was the one I was most excited about. So I don't again, get a chance to do much of this stuff anymore. Just I'm bu busy sort of running things behind the scene. But this is this is the the absolute highlight uh, of, of my 2021. It's been a pleasure. Oh, you're the man, brother. Thank you again for everything, dude. Anytime you wanted to do again, just hit me up. Anytime. Thank you. I appreciate it. Can you uh, just look down the camera and give us a join us and we'll stick it all over social media. A big join us down the camera. Uh, all right. Join us. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs> My man. Thank you, brother.